had to convince some of those folks leaving their lunch. I think so. <laughs> Sorry, the mic's off. All right. Well, <laughs> why don't we go ahead and get started? It's great to see everyone. Lunch will be served after this panel, so everyone come on in. You can hear some interesting uh, conversations. There are a few issues that we're going to try to tackle. We have a, a very diverse panel, representation from Chile, from Belarus, from the United Arab Emirates, um, Denmark, the European Union. So we're going to really get this truly is sustainable energy for all, but try to tackle some, some big picture issues. Um, one, the importance of a diverse energy mix in order to attain uh, universal access. Another issue is just the importance of the, the, the investment climate. Our different speakers come from different places. We're at, at different stages of investment. We look at Chile and the UAE, which have, uh, are really competing against one another Can for some of the least expensive solar, solar power in the world. And then you look at uh, the work that, that the US government, others, the EU are doing in sub-Saharan Africa where frequently what they're doing. Am I speaking over? Okay. It's okay. up there. Another panel. I think uh, right. where, where, where countries are just starting to do some of their first renewable projects. We'll also talk a little bit about the importance of civil society in the energy mix as well. So why don't we go ahead and let's get started. Um, I want to go ahead and ask that we open up with, with Christian Zinglerson from, uh, uh, from the Clean Energy Ministerial to talk a bit about uh, the role of civil society uh, in kind of coming up with a clean energy mix. Yeah, thanks a lot. So I think I inadvertently said uh, we're going to try, try to get some people back from lunch and, and get here to the, to the chairs. And I want to thank all of you for, uh, for doing that and, uh, and listening to us. Um, am I coming through? Can you hear what we're saying more or less? OK, very good. All right. So maybe one thing which I'll start off with <clears throat> an impression, which is relevant for civil society, probably even more relevant for sort of the evolution of power systems. So early November, I was in a conference in Suzhou. It was an energy transition conference organized by the Energy Administration of China. And it was placed in Suzhou because that's one of the significant industrial bases for China. And um, part of the, the discussions, quite prominently from politically high up, was the transformation of the power system and increasing flexibility of the power system. This was in the exact same days where what is called the winter package, some of you will be familiar with that, in Europe were being discussed. Flexibility, increasing the flexibility of the power system, looking at the contributions of flexibility from the supply side, the demand side, interconnection side, uh, etc. And it was striking how f basically common the challenges were in a Chinese context and in the European context. And so three weeks ago, I was in uh, Delhi uh, speaking with several uh, Indian uh, officials in various capacities and so forth. And again there, they're discussing a lot how this massive introduction of renewables with very attractive uh, prices associated with that, what that means for the evolution of their power system and how they can have a more flexible power system trying to increase the flexibility also of the thermal generation fleet. So at least at the headline level, I think this is a very common evolutionary path for power systems. It has implications for civil society. It has implications for many different stakeholders, but pointing towards further flexibilization. We can dive into that in a second. I know you're probably going to want me to, to wrap up. So I will say one particular aspect. Uh, I, since 1 February, I have taken over the head of the Clean Energy Ministerial Secretariat. I won't bore you with what that is. But one of the things which the Clean Energy Ministerial will probably launch a few months from now at the ministerial meeting, which is hosted by the Chinese government in June, June, is one particular aspect of this challenge, further flexibilizing the power systems as they go forward, namely further uh, furthering the flexibility of the traditional thermal generation fleet. That may sound a little bit technical and boring, but I think the politics of it are hugely significant because in very many countries, often this evolutionary path is projected as being it's renewables against coal, and never the two shall meet. It's an intrinsic battle, and you know we'll see who who stands winning at the same time. Whilst in many of these jurisdictions, actually coal is going to be a fairly dominant source of supply for some years uh, yet. Yeah. So actually trying to flexibilize further the traditional thermal generation fleet will give some of the incumbents a future. They will see that they have a remuneration future and they will be less intrinsically opposed to the gradual introduction of renewables. 
So I think that's, that is one thing to watch out for. Okay. I'm going to move to Chile, to Cristian Gutierrez, who uh, Chile has, I understand, a plan, probably 20, uh, uh, a 2050 plan related to its energy mix. And one of the things in developing that plan, I'm curious, one, what was the role in the private sector and civil society in developing that plan? And what do you, what, what can you kind of summarize what that plan looks like? in terms well, of the energy mix. Good afternoon. Um, my speech, I, I'm go, going to, to make it in Spanish. Eh? Uh, la verdad es que en el caso chileno, hasta el año 2014, la, la matriz energética era sumamente contaminante y basada en carbono. Uh, y a partir de ese minuto se produjo un cambio. Eh, precisamente con el, con el cambio de gobierno diseñamos una estrategia de largo plazo una estrategia al año 2050 de carácter que lleva el Ministerio de Energía en conjunto con el Ministerio de Ambiente y otros ministerios uh, con un arduo proceso de participación ciudadana. Se trabajó en primer lugar con expertos, luego con los regulados, luego con la sociedad civil. Y se produjo un diálogo de al menos dos años eh, donde se pudo evacuar, eh, acordar y también disentir eh, los principales objetivos de esta, de esta estrategia y el objetivo principal era ponerse metas eh, al, al año 2025 y al año 2050. Uh, until 2014, uh, most of the energy that we were producing was very polluting, so we had to change that. Uh, with the change of the government, we start to develop a energy strategy with the commitment also with the private sector and the civil society and the academy and we start to work together in order to develop a new energy strategy looking not only for the next years only uh, and until the 2050 so we work together and we establish different uh, participation uh, process and meetings for almost uh, two years and after that, uh, that work uh, helped us to set uh, the, the rules of the, what we want to do uh, with the energy development of our country uh, and set the pathway and the roadmap of the things that we have to do in order to get there. So uh, one of the most important results of that is uh, the goal of uh, achieving 70% of the electricity that we were going to produce in 2050 uh, has to come from uh, renewables. So, so to get, I'm going to stay with you for a moment. To get to the, the world famous solar power that's less than three cents a kilowatt hour in Chile. Para llegar al famoso 30 centavos que que se logran con la licitación de una central energética en Chile solar. Is that is that truly a market based price, or were you able to get that price? due to some of the uh, taxes, the green taxes and other things that you have in Chile? Bueno, usted dice, ¿este efecto que se logra es un efecto real eh, de, de la economía o tiene que ver con otros efectos asociados a los impuestos que hemos puesto? No, lo, lo que ocurre es que nosotros eh, le solicitamos a la industria un porcentaje de eh, energía renovable, que capturaran un porcentaje de energía renovable una vez que se adjudicaban las licitaciones de los paquetes energéticos. Esta comillas, obligación hacia las empresas eh, produjo que cotizaran entonces eh, la obligación, por ejemplo, si se le solicitaba un 5% de energía renovable, eh, ellos fueron a hacer la cotización al mercado y descubrieron que los valores producto, por ejemplo, en el caso de la energía solar, a propósito de que Chile tiene un gran desierto, el desierto de Atacama, eran valores eh, similares o en muchos casos menores Por tanto, en vez de comprar el 5%, lo que ocurrió es que compraron el 10, el 12% y se produjo un mecanismo virtuoso, a diferencia de lo que ocurrió en Europa cuando se inició el proceso de la, de la energía renovable. Well, uh, we, we start the, 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 this strategy setting a law that uh, puts a requirement of a minimum percentage of uh, renewables in the new package of electricity that you buy for every company, and uh, also what uh, the public sector buys. And with that, uh, that set in motion all the, the development of uh, energy. And uh, because uh, in five years ago, uh, if you were in Chile, most of the people said renewables are expensive, are much more expensive than we are paying uh, now. And with this uh, simple law that they have to consider the option of buying this electricity, we find out that when we were asking them to buy a 5%, 
they were buying 10 and 12 percent because they find out that it was cheaper. And also, uh, when the government start to uh, make the, the, the bids uh, to buy electricity for the regulated sector, uh, we uh, set a package with different uh, uh, bl blocks of energy. With that, we establish a preference for solar in some uh, packages and other packages more likely for wind. And with that, uh, we get the best of the prices that we can get from uh, solar power in that case. And, with that, uh, and that is the case that you, you are uh, speaking about, the 29 cents uh, per kilowatt hour. Well, actually, so let's turn to the UAE as well with uh, Dr. Nawal from Mostar, which also is the other country with the world famous power for uh, less than three cents a kilowatt hour. Can you tell us, can you break down that price for us a little bit and tell us, is it truly a market-based price or are there subsidies that go into that? Because, and it's important that we talk about this because I think when people read about it, every country assumes that they can get solar power for that same price. So please be completely, completely honest with us about what goes into that so that companies that are legitimately trying to bring solar power into new markets uh, aren't suddenly getting, you know, being told that they can't, they're not going to do it, a country won't move forward with it, unless they can do it for three cents a kilowatt hour. What uh, lessons are to be learned for others? I think the main lesson to be learned is that you need to have a very uh, strong and clear policy framework, and that happens with very strong uh, uh, public-private partnership. Then, if you are deploying a proven, bankable technologies, then bringing investment is not going to be a challenge. So it's basically the lessons that we've seen. You know, once you uh, unify basically the circumstances and unify the different variables, then you will get that price. You know, you have, like in Chile, you have a strong uh, policy framework. Like in the UAE, you have a very strong leadership that is pushing for renewables. And once, with renewables, once you know what is going to be the outcome and how you are going to uh, prove your, uh, your technology and, and you, you know, you reach a, a certain level of efficiencies in your technology, then I, I believe you can reach, you can achieve that number. So you have the number in Chile, you have the number in UAE, and you know, there is, there is a vast wide, a vast basically uh, space between them. But you know, for us, for Mostar, that has been a profitable, we are a profitable company, we're a commercial company, so for us to basically bid with this number, we did, definitely did not leave any money on the table. Yeah. So we are making money, we're making profit, and I'm sure the companies that are bid for Chile will do the same. Uh, what is basically bringing this, uh, or, or bringing this uh, to reality is the commitment and the policy, the clear policy framework from this government and the deployment of uh, a bankable technologies. I, I think what you're saying is absolutely spot on. Uh, I think some people are tired of hearing me say that there's there's no shortage of deals out there and there's no shortage of, of money willing to invest, but what you need is a predictable investment climate. And in fact, I was just speaking with a colleague from, from a country and pleading with him just to get one deal across the finish line and let investors know that this is a predi predictable investment climate. And I said, that in and of itself will bring down the cost of capital because everybody else will want to do business there, there'll be more competition, and it'll bring down the cost of the deal. So you, you've confirmed that. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and, and banks can see it. There is a very clear return of investment. Once again, once you have a very strong policy framework, banks will definitely commit, and, they, and, and, and there is money to be invested, I believe. And you know, we've, we've seen it, and, and we understand that there, is, there are so many deals to be, to be taken. I'm going to turn to Roberto because uh, the European Union has its Electrify uh, facility and I'm actually really happy to see Mayank from NextGen Solar here who I won't announce anything. I'll let you decide to do that. The, uh, but anyway, one of the things that you're doing is you're trying to move these first of their type deals across the finish line. Can you tell us a little bit about that and the importance of the investment climate uh, or the, the policy framework in the country to create that investment climate? Indeed, uh, and uh, I hope you hear well because I can't hear what my I can't hear anything say either. here. <laughs> it's really difficult. Are you all able to hear but us? But your reaction, okay. your reaction will help us to have a feedback <laughs> from our colleagues. I tell you this because ownership of what we say is important as ownership of countries. 
in this uh, regulatory environment. So the key word is political will, number one. In order to reduce the cost and therefore make easy for investments, the political environment in the country for investment must be appropriate, which is not always a question of finance. I would say that 80% of the factors hampering or reducing or limiting investments are not financial. 80, 20 sort of, because what we are looking at, one problem, you say 3 cents, 4 cents, 10 cents. Well, solar energy is intermittent, doesn't flow in the night. So in order to have a total supply of good, stable electricity to the country, you need to produce with something else in order to put together with solar. So in a way, the cost of solar in the grid, which is the easiest way to produce electricity, must be looked at balancing other sources, other generation sources, into the grid to balance in the night, when there is cloudy, etc. That is a sort of subsidy, cross-subsidy between different generations. And the government must look at that the government of the country action, so the title of this deep dive is very important. We took uh, examples of good uh, countries like Chile and others. I would mention also in Zambia, we had recently an auction at uh, 9 cents per kilowatt hour for solar on grid. A little bit subsidized, a little bit subsidized. What is important, Andy, and colleagues, is to look at the provision of uh, solid, reliable, modern access to electricity to all people. And that's where Electrify comes in, to top the difference between the grid. The grid uh, in certain countries is 99%. In other countries is 25%. So the access to these beautiful things, which is energy, is not spread evenly. And that's where we conceived this Electrify, which was launched two years ago at the Sustainable Energy for All Forum in New York. It was a better acoustic, but doesn't matter. <laughs> where we said, and we did, also with the help of Power Africa and others, we did provide the risk finance for mini-grid, off-grid, but also home system solutions, which are decentralized, because energy access cannot wait. I would like that we share a couple of key words, ownership on the political willingness to have this environment, and sometimes technical agencies cannot do the political work that we can do in working with countries to have these reforms. Two, Access to energy cannot wait. Uh, access to energy cannot okay. wait. Okay. I thought you said three. <laughs> Just two? You're saving uh, the Normally one it would trigger an applause, okay. but here we are not in that <laughs> mood. <laughs> well, I can hear you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to turn to, to Valentin Rybakov from the Belarus and to talk a little bit about uh, the energy mix in Belarus in particular. We were, we were prepping. I said, let's talk about solar. And he said, I have to be honest, in Belarus, we don't have the greatest you know, sun resource for, for solar power. So why don't you talk to us a little bit about what Belarus is doing to try to ensure that it has a more diverse energy mix and how that goes to contribute to energy security in your country. Andy, thank you very much. Um, you're absolutely right. Of course, we are not famous for solar, solar power, solar energy and increasing the use of renewable energy sources is just a, a strategic objective as set by the government of Belarus. Uh, and we are carrying out various activities to, in all areas, you know, sun, wind, uh, water, wood biomass, etc., uh, etc. Et and one of the most significant priorities for us uh, is to increase the use of renewable energy sources, uh, especially in the housing and utility services of Belarus. Uh, we have significant forest resources. Actually, 39% of the territory of Belarus is covered by forests. So 
uh, we have a high potential for the development of biomass energy, and as a result, right now, for instance, 70% of public utility systems in Belarus are operating on uh, wood biomass. Uh, we practically do not have uh, oil, we don't have any gas, we are 100% dependent on our partners, mm -hmm. uh, especially on the Russian Federation for gas supplies, oil supplies. So we are, of course, doing everything possible to, uh, you know, diversify. But also, Andy, I would like to draw our attention to the fact that we are actually participating in a sustainable energy for all forum. Uh, I also attended, I also participated in a previous forum in New York a couple of years ago. And we, Belarus, set forth a proposal, actually, uh, because this Sustainable Energy for All initiative is a very important step in bringing together different, uh, you know, actors, uh, international, governmental, uh, public uh, areas to support access to energy, energy efficiency, uh, to increase the global share of uh, renewables. If we are talking about sustainable development goals, uh, we, have to, uh, we have to remember that there is not a single comprehensive approach to energy issues within the United Nations, for instance, because we have IAEA, which is engaged in nuclear energy, we have UNIDO dealing with energy efficiency, IRENA with renewable energy, etc., etc., but there is no coherent single mechanism to deal with energy issues. So we believe that this uh, initiative is very important and could be used, could serve as a platform for different actors in various uh, areas to work together to deal with the problems we are discussing. What, to what degree is the work of, of SE for All benefiting Belarus? What, what's, your, what's your access rate in Belarus? What percentage of the population has access to power in Belarus? To power? Yeah. It's, it's, it's close to 100%. 100%. We are a small country. We have a total population of less than 10 million people. I mean, we are a well-developed country. It's, it's not a, access is not a problem. Right. But so in terms of the benefits of SE for All for Belarus, what are there? Are there renewables, 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 you know, t uh, access to technologies, access to, to energy technologies. Uh, we, of course, as a country that is still suffering from the consequences of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, at the same time, we made a conscious decision to build a nuclear power station. And we are building a nuclear power station. It will be operational next, next couple of years, you know. Um, so basically, we are looking at this, uh, at this, uh, at this idea, at this concept, as, as, as I said, as a very solid basis, as a very solid platform for all countries, all actors concerned to work together. Okay. So for Chile, same question. You have 99% access. What are some of the benefits that Chile derives from, from SE for All and the work that we're all doing here? Obviously, we get to exchange a lot of information, but are there, what do you see as the role of Chile with respect to sustainable energy for all? as a beneficiary, as a contributor, or a combination? Bueno, la verdad es que Chile, al haber elevado su ingreso per cápita la última, la última década... Just ran over there. Oh, there is Christian. <laughs> Chile, al haber elevado su ingreso per cápita las últimas dos décadas, um, ha sido sujeto de una retirada de la cooperación internacional, eh, primero la del desarrollo y luego en otras materias. Sin embargo, el... Chile in the in the last years with the increase of the GDP, eh, we have eh, becoming we're becoming a developing country, developed country. So eh, we are eh, losing access to eh, finance of other countries and international aid. Sin embargo, el C for All lo que nos está dando es otro prisma de la cooperación, que por un lado es muy técnica, lo que nos hace 
llevar a, al aparato del Estado, particularmente a los ministerios de Energía, Hacienda y Medio Ambiente, a un upgrade de conocimiento. So the, this space, the Sustainable Energy for All, is helping us in a different way. It's giving us technical support that has allowed our ministries of Treasury, of Environment and Energy to go to the next level in terms of technical capacities. Y por otro lado, eh, nos ha contribuido mucho a poder entender y acelerar el match entre empresa privada, políticas públicas y sociedad civil. Eh, en Chile, por la experiencia política traumática, esos tres sectores estaban muy disociados y la economía solo estaba alojada en el sector industrial. Y, y hoy día el diálogo al que nos lleva c for all y las organizaciones eh, UN Environment y, y otras que, que nos colaboran, eh, nos ha hecho eh, poder pensar el país en forma conjunta. Uh, also the all the, this dialogue that we have developed uh, between the private sector, the the policy development sector and also the civil society has uh, make us to develop a, a new way of working also with the support of other agencies like UN Environment and others can help us to develop better policies and get together and make all these sectors work together because in the past we, we haven't exactly that uh, in, in the way that we were doing things. The economy was uh, seen only for the private sector. By now it's something that we are uh, using to make uh, new rules and incentive the market through the uh, regulations. Esto, finalmente, muy breve, pero esto es como una semilla que, cambió, que cayó en terreno fértil, producto de que eh, eh, la estabilidad política, la estabilidad social que tiene el país, hace que independiente del cambio de gobierno, esto se sostenga. Así for all nos ha dado un ejemplo para ello y, y por otro lado, ha favorecido entonces eh, que nuestras metas, por ejemplo, las de energía 20% de energía al 2025 las hayamos superado con muchos años de anticipación, incluso las hemos triplicado. Uh, also, uh, this is like a seed that uh, falls in, in good soil because uh, uh, the information and the knowledge that we get for the C for all has helped us to develop uh, policies, long-term policies, because uh, we luckily have a country that has a Uh, with uh, political climates and we have long-term policies that uh, can help to uh, give uh, clear rules to the private sector in order to make the investments that they, we need. And because of that, we have been able to overachieve our first uh, goal of 20% uh, of renewals for 2025. And we are going probably to triple that uh, for uh, 2050. Uh, okay. Thank you. I do, I'm going to ask one more question, but also give the audience a chance to ask. Is that you're, you're saying the same thing? Give the audience a chance to ask questions? Yes. Okay. I, I was going to ask a little bit more about, but before that, before one thing. That, okay, go ahead. Thank you, We've only got about five minutes left, so <laughs> one keep minute. it to one minute. One minute for me to tell you that we have in front a dream that can come true. Because countries can do a leapfrog into a renewable era without passing through what others have passed through. This is today possible. It's not possible with public finance. It's not. It is possible with public action, public policies, and private investments. Yet, on the private investment, one single factor, the most important of all... This is number three. All right. Yeah. Guarantee. Yeah. Guaranteeing the off-taking of the generation, the renewable generation. Guaranteeing. And many countries but, but Roberto, cannot afford one of the issues that, Yeah, many can't afford it, though. That's the, a lot of the countries where you're looking for the new investment that need the investment most desperately can't afford the guarantee because they've already hit their, their limits on. So, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Here we come. <laughs> so it's coming. <laughs> one answer. Andrew. Yes. The EU external investment plan foresees guarantees, exactly the kind of instrument that goes towards the private investor, saying, I can invest, I find my money, I find the money in Brooklyn, I find the money in Manhattan, but I need a guarantee for my energy to be bought. And that is what, what we are coming for. And that is a magic, 
and a major change, Andrew. You know that we discussed already a few weeks ago in Washington. We continue here. It's going to become reality around November, December this year. It's complex, but it will flow. And that will be the leapfrog. Massive investments in renewable that today cannot take place. Well, let me ask you. So, Mostar, do you invest exclusively in the UAE? Or do you invest in... We invest everywhere. Everywhere. Our, so our, would, our would, would this EU everywhere. guarantee make investments in sub-Saharan Africa a lot more attractive to you? He can guarantee it, of course. Okay. They don't need our guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but let's, but let's, yes. but let's talk a little guarantees. bit about what is it. And just, uh, why don't we just do a quick speed round and uh, just telling us one or two things that you think a country needs to do to attract the private capital, no, what you're seeing. And I'm not talking about the United States or the UAE. I'm talking, because I work in well, Sub-Saharan like Africa, Power Africa, Africa focused on Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and we're trying to get first of their kind deals across the finish line. If you had advice, a predictable investment climate, we said, but just one or two reforms that you think are the most critical to drive the private investment, what do you think those are? You need to de-risk this investment, exactly. You cannot de-risk your, your investment if you don't have the right, you know, the, the political will that is basically having the right policy framework. If you don't have the right policy framework, no investor is going to come. Okay. And it's very, very important. So you need to have the right you know, the, the right policy framework. You need to, for, of course, for renewables, you need to have the right environmental conditions for the technology to work. And you need to have, you know, you need to have the right political will to drive. And, so and political the, will. Political from will. From the top. From the top. Okay, I'm moving on because we're down to three minutes. Yeah. What, is, what would you say, the one or two key, one, in 30 seconds? One, I would agree. And two, I think the political will needs to translate into a system integrated approach not looking exclusively at the supply side, falling costs of an intermittent generation, which will need to be offset, if I can use that term, by comprehensive energy planning. So one political will and make it comprehensive, not just focusing on supply. Okay. I agree. But you're all, you're all giving very broad no. things. No, I, mean, I would add, like it's very not, only, I mean, I agree with yeah. not only political it's will, political will political but also will political will stability. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Political stability, Two good tariffs, good tariffs right. that compensate the, 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 the work and the investments done, and three, the rule of law. Okay, political stability, rule of law, and tariffs. And tariffs. Yeah, really and legal. We have political stability, we have political will. What we need is access to advanced technologies, including renewables. Basically, without that, it would be impossible for any country, including Belarus, to implement SDGs. Okay. In Chile, mm -hmm. I'll give you the last word. Uh, para nosotros está muy claro que lo primero es, como dijo alguien allí, tener las reglas claras. Pero también en la parte ambiental, tener un sistema de evaluación de impacto ambiental que garantice que todas estas inversiones van a tener el mismo estándar y la misma medida, en, espe en especial en la relación con las comunidades donde se realiza la inversión o los trazados. Y lo segundo es tener una hoja de ruta clara como la que nosotros tenemos al 2050, publicada y aprobada por todos los sectores de la sociedad. Eh, for us also is uh, clear rules for the investments and but also we have to work in the in a clear and good system for evaluation of the environmental impacts of the projects, especially in the relationship with the communities that are nearby. Because for any kind of energy, when you have a big growth of that, you have people that is going to oppose that to that energy, even if it's wind power or solar power. So you have to make these rules very clear for the people and also set a system of evaluation that gives guarantees to the private sector for the investment, but also to the communities of what they are going to do is correct and will uh, be good for the people also. Great, thank you. All right, one, one more one, word. Yeah, just final one, uh, to your point. You know, technology is, is allowing us now to leapfrog a lot of our challenges. And getting an, a right energy mix now became a priority for so many countries. So we see that everywhere, even in the GCC, where people were very skeptical about 
you know, well to get renewables. Renewable energy became now part of every energy mix in any, all the GCC countries. A few, few weeks ago, when we were at Abu Dhabi Sustainability Week, and we had all the ministers of energy of the GCC, GCC countries sitting there discussing renewables at Abu Dhabi Sustainability Week. Now that, a few years ago, would have been, you know, something that nobody would even think it's going to happen. So have, looking at having the right energy mix within your grid is very important, and a lot of governments now is planning for it. And, and, and that's basically back to what Michael said yesterday. Renewables now are not alternative energy. It's became part of the reality. And it's market competitive. Absolutely. All right, well, thank you, everyone. I'd like to thank the panelists as well. I think they turned off my microphone. Here we go. Um, I just want a, a quick announcement. The partners' working sessions will begin in 15 minutes, and the details of those sessions will be on the monitors. And please grab a bite to eat now. The local food trucks are on the way to your partner working sessions. So, so thanks, everyone. <laughs>